Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, uh, Dr. Obatashaka, for uh, uh, being a part of this. And uh, I'm turning it over to you now, sir. OK, so the uh, topic is Malcolm Revisited, right? Yes. And uh, we're supposed to have a conversation with me and uh, Professor James Smalls, my buddy. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Tashaka, uh, uh, Professor Small sent me a note saying that he was running late, and then and that he'll he'll drop in. Okay, so he'll so he's he he, he he's uh, he's on his way. Okay. Okay. All right. I just finished my show, the Dr. Over Tashaka show, and that was. Uh, what happened? Appreciate y'all coming on back. That's Damani. Yeah, next week it'll be uh, three to four for sure at the African market. Okay. The outside, they have a stage, the same stage to be there. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. Make me a co-host and I can help you mute, Brother Minister, if you want. All right. There you go. All right. All right. Sorry, Dr. Tashaka. Yeah I, yeah, I just finished uh, the Dr. Over to Shaka show. It was off at 12.30, so I was on for a two and a half hours dealing with the Twa Mothers of Humanity and uh, creators of African world civilization. So um, I understand that we're talking about um, revisiting Malcolm and um, James Smalls and I both have some experiences in that. Most people know that I'm the author of The Political Legacy of Malcolm X. Um, this is the first book I wrote and Dr. Asa Hilliard uh, reviewed it and, um, and Dr. Nathan Hare. And um, he stated basically that he thought that this work dwarfed dwarfed all writings on Malcolm, uh, including the autobiography. And um, then Michael Eric Dyson reviewed this book in the New York Times against all books on Malcolm and rated it number one. On my show, uh, the Dr. Obu Tashaka show, I had an interview um, uh, about three or four weeks ago um, on the assassination of Malcolm X with uh, Baba Zak Kondo, and he is the foremost authority on Malcolm's assassination. His book was inspired by mine, and I read his manuscript in rough draft form and knew it was an outstanding work. He went to the FBI headquarters and did research on uh, the assassination. And I think that interview has generated over 100 comments and only one negative one. <laughs> so that means that he really covered his subject because that was a controversial thing. You walk into the minefield of the nation and Malcolm and so forth. So uh, I make some comments on Malcolm um, and uh, his legacy and revisiting him. I also have up on my show site a speech that I delivered on Malcolm X um, at our school, African Children's Advanced Learning Center in 2009 and dealt with new material uh, on Malcolm. Uh, so the uh, first thing that I would say, and this is one that my book, um, The Political Legacy of Malcolm X focused on, and up to the time I wrote the book, no other author had, but since then, Rodno Collins, who was uh, Malcolm's sister's son, has uh, written a book on Malcolm. It was basically the memoirs of his mother, who was Malcolm's sister, Ella. And um, he wrote it with the assistance of another writer called The Seventh Child. And so this reconfirms some conclusions I had reached with information coming from the family. And so I'd say the first thing about Malcolm in looking at his legacy is to understand that you need to look at him through his eyes. 
not through yours, if you can, because we're often in most people who write about Malcolm, they're giving you their version of Malcolm and very often uh, distorting the image, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. And in fact, if you're looking at the scholarship on Malcolm, um, there's a category of scholarship that I would call system scholarship that basically has set out to uh, redefine Malcolm's image. And uh, groups like books like Peter Goldman's The Death and Life of Malcolm X, uh, and uh, Breitman's book, though I think he thinks he was well intentioned, Breitman, The Evolution of a Revolutionary, and unfortunately, the autobiography of Malcolm X, because um, there was censorship of that book that to this day has not been honest, honestly described. And that includes Manning Marvel's work. He doesn't really know where the censorship came from. So if you're censoring him, then automatically you're going to exclude um, certain key core essences of Malcolm. So, you know, I think that in seeing him through his eyes, the way Malcolm viewed the world was through the lens of family. And um, we can say we all do. No, we don't. Everybody's not family oriented. For example, you could raise the question with Malcolm, um, with the loss of his father, uh, which now, um, new book on Malcolm um, called The Dead Are Arising by Les Payne. Um, it shows that uh, there are a number of corrections that need to be made in terms of discussing Malcolm, one of which is the view that Malcolm was killed by the Klan of the right wing. Um, he has some pretty convincing documentation that his death was an accident. But even if it was, there was a systematic attempt to drive him and his family out of various black communities violently led by the Klan. Uh, so when we're looking at Malcolm's legacy, you could see that the um, death of his father and um, the um, uh, fact that the mother underwent great strain uh, that led to depression that was treated as though she was mentally insane, which she was not, um, that that had a devastating effect on Malcolm, but a different effect on the rest of the family. And, you, and it, it was devastating for all of them. But in Malcolm's case, it particularly um, unhinged him in certain ways, particularly around the message that he received from his family, not being able to follow through on it the way the rest of his family members did, some of whom were younger than him. And that includes Reginald. So they were able to hold on to core uh, Garvey-I teachings coming from uh, Malcolm's father and mother. And the mother's role has been underestimated. She played a key role in uh, the Garvey movement. She wrote for the newspaper, the UNIA. Um, and one of her cousins was a bodyguard to uh, Marcus Garvey when he was on the run uh, facing a internal Bureau of Investigation arrest warrant and attack then under J. Edgar Hoover, that later became the FBI. Uh, so why would this, uh, these two, two traumatic events upset Malcolm more than the rest of his family? Well, part maybe the color issue that's brought out in the autobiography, but his mother did a lot to try and inoculate him against that by teaching him pride. So that may have played some role. Um, and certainly he got transferred into homes of whites after he was engaged in some you know, behavior that put him in that position. But I would say that the main reason that um, the death of his father and uh, the commitment of his mother to an insane asylum for over 20 years um, had a, a real uh, 
powerful effect on him and affected his course of life until he was able to recover himself in prison. And that led him into some street action and stuff. And so I would say the main reason is family was more central for Malcolm than it was for other family members. This was a person who viewed the world through family and just about everything in his life demonstrates that. And so the loss of two extremely important figures early on um, would have that effect. And at the same time, his family would be the one that would uh, help Malcolm recover his identity, introducing him to the nation of Islam. But Malcolm's um, family influences go further than that. The seven child reinforces some stuff that I stress, but they knew better because they're coming from the family perspective. The autobiography tells you that Malcolm was introduced to the conch by Shorty on the street. And then Malcolm talked about how this was degradation and how he admired uh, jazz musicians and others who didn't conk their hair, even though he was conking his hair. But if you read The Seventh Child, you'll see that um, Malcolm began to admire that style uh, by imitating his oldest brother, who was a jazz singer and uh, who went with Billie Holiday. You know, that's not in the autobiography. The autobiography tells you that Malcolm was introduced to hustling, which he exaggerated. He called himself a pimp. He, he, he wasn't a pimp. But what he did is he was a shoeshine man who referred people to reefers, someone that had marijuana, and um, would, would refer him to a hustler, someone who was a pimp. But who was the one that referred him to that? It was his uh, sister. Ella's former husband. Now, he doesn't tell you that in the autobiography. He makes it appear that it was some slick street guy who was orienting him to hustling because that made him look more street than he was. You know what I mean? But the key point is it was family. You know what I mean? So you can't see a part of Malcolm where family is not playing the driving role, the driving role. Um, it's often stressed that Malcolm built the nation Islam. He was the primary organizer, and he was. Took him from a broke organization to assets of 75 million by the time he left. That doesn't sound like a lot now. That would be close to 600, 700 million, close to a billion in dollar terms then, you know? Uh, so uh, that is, the impression that Malcolm built the nation. He did, but before him, his family did. And it was his brother, his oldest brother, who recruited him into the nation by way of Reginald. They manipulated that because they knew Malcolm would listen to someone who had some street knowledge, uh, enough to hustle Malcolm. So if he was such a good hustler, how do you get hustled by his younger brother? <laughs> he wasn't that good. And fortunate for us, because if he had been, we might have lost him to the streets, you know? Uh, so family. And then everyone knows Elijah Muhammad was like a father figure for him. So a former corporal of the Garvey movement. Malcolm's father um, was an organizer in the Garvey movement. Coming out of the Philadelphia, he and his wife out of the Philadelphia chapter. And that was the strong, second strongest chapter in the UNIA. Um, Eason, who was the stre second strongest leader in the Garvey movement, uh, who led the American section of the UNIA, chaired the Philadelphia section. And then Malcolm's family uh, made the decision to move into some tough areas, Omaha and others, where you had very few Blacks hard places to organize. I don't even know it was wise to go into those kind of communities, uh, but that's where they organized and showed the courage that they had. So if you can understand Malcolm, understand family. That's the key to him. Everything was viewed through the lens of family. 
it was his sister Ella that financed his trip to Africa. You know, when she wanted to go on the Hodge first, she gave him the money so he could. Uh, some say that Malcolm was even attracted to women of a certain age because of the messenger's influence. That isn't true. Malcolm was naturally attracted to women of a different age, and the messenger, in fact, did not want Malcolm to marry. That comes out in the uh, uh, missing chapters in the autobiography purchased by Anita Baker's husband when he bought the manuscript to the autobiography of Malcolm X. So that was his particular focus when it came to relationships. Uh, so the severing of the ties between Malcolm and the nation was particularly hard on him because that was family. At the same time, the nation um, had helped him grow, but it also stunted his growth because he was in the nation too long because the nation was resisting the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and others, his political direction. So he ended up in a straitjacket. We had a meeting with Malcolm. I did in 13 out of the leaders of the Black Freedom Movement in the Bay Area in 1963, some reporter newspaper building. I give an account of it in the political legacy of Malcolm X. And this was Malcolm's attempt to reach out to the Young Turks. I would end up leading the Black Nationalist Wing within the Congress of Racial Equality. And Malcolm felt that the nation was becoming isolated in the Black Freedom Movement because while they were doing good work in building businesses and schools and keeping people off of drugs and getting them off of drugs and uh, providing work and stabilizing families, uh, this was good. Uh, they had a, uh, a view of non-engagement when it came into the movement. The messenger's view was that they were a religious organization that dealt with certain kinds of institutional things. And I think he had a number of reasons for not wanting to engage in the movement. Probably the biggest one is he had a 501c3 and probably didn't want to lose it. But the main one was he was religious. He, prim he wasn't primarily political, but he was black, but he wasn't African. It was a real key thing to st stress. Malcolm was the one that brought the African emphasis into the nation of Islam. The messenger was against that and would later voice opposition to Muslims marrying Africans, voice opposition to Muslims wearing African clothes, you know, after Malcolm was exited. So he didn't particularly like Malcolm's African emphasis in the nation but he also saw it help the nation grow. So he tolerated it for a period of time. So when we met with him in 63, it was the summer of 1963, um, Malcolm was in the company of the minister from Los Angeles. They were both wearing seersucker suits. By the way, when I have meetings like this, I take no notes. I met Julius Nereri, president of Tanzania, 19... Uh, 77. I took no notes. I remember everything that was said. When anything important in my life comes down, I don't have to take no notes. It's in, it's in my subconscious as well as my conscious. So I can tell you everything that happened in that meeting, you know. And I wasn't fully aware of Malcolm's significance at that time. I'd been elected chair of the San Francisco chapter, Congress of Racial Equality in 1963, January I assumed office. I had just ended six years in the Marine Reserves. I was a brainwashed Negro in the Marine Reserves, but I was the baddest one in my unit. <laughs> but then later I would discover that my um, military involvement would be the movement. And uh, in fact, my company commander was a guy named Pete McClowski who provided the information to Geronimo Pratt's attorney that freed him from prison. He was a white boy but a progressive white boy. And he wanted me to become an officer in the Marine Corps. I'd been a Lieutenant Colonel in ROTC. I'm basically a soldier. My wife says I dress in uniforms. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm a soldier. <laughs> I'm a warrior first. <laughs> and my scholarship comes from that. So I had just cashiered out of the Marines, which really helped me because I didn't have no Vietnam issues. I wasn't going to Vietnam, but this time I was fully discharged. You can't get me. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, expert 
riflemen and you know, I was trained in all kinds of warfare and I became a counterinsurgency specialist. By the way, CIA tried to kill me three times. FBI. FBI denied me a teaching credential to teach in Marin after I taught for a year. Ray Richardson got me the job and then the FBI ran a Conantel Pro. And I could have beat him, but my spirit, I'm going to Sacramento to hire a lawyer and the spirit said no. I don't know why the spirit telling me that. I turned around. Well, three years later, I'm teaching at state. <laughs> so they bought me out of the public schools. I'm in the university. The FBI really came after me. But I had Asa Hilliard as chair of my HRT committee, hiring and retention committee. That's your union job. Once you get that, you have to commit murder to lose the job. You know what I mean? <laughs> and Asa fought for me, and I ended up getting tenured. I've never lost a battle. This is a key thing I want to stress. So Malcolm was meeting with the Young Turks, and I'm one of the Young Turks. I was 22 years old then. And um, so in that meeting, Malcolm was trying to bridge the gap that the nation wasn't allowing him to, feel, uh, to full, fulfill, which was to try and at least stay in touch with where the movement was at. And so when I came into the room, Malcolm is sitting with his back to the wall, which was his custom, which is a good custom. That means you really understand that you do have an enemy, you know what I mean? Be aware of what's going on, you know what I mean? Because some of us in the black so-called liberation movement, we don't know how to shoot a gun. Malcolm didn't either, by the way, that, um, um, carbine that he had in his window didn't have a firing gun. And Malcolm didn't know it because he didn't know how to strip a weapon down and put it back together. We know how to do that blindfolded, you know what I mean? So he couldn't shoot, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it looked good because I'm sure the Muslims saw him with that carbine in his hand, 30 caliber carbine, and they said, oh, <laughs> you know? So Malcolm went into an analysis of the Black Freedom Movement. And when he was, and he used, his technique was to lay out newspapers. He had them on a table and then quote, make critique based on the newspapers. And the main newspaper he had was the New York Times. Uh, <clears throat> he gained that technique from his mother because the way the mother would teach is when the kids came home, she would teach from um, the uh, Garvey newspaper and uh, from the Liberation newspaper in Grenada. And she was a follower of both leaders. And so she would quote from those newspapers. And then when Malcolm or any of the children could not spell a word, she sent them to the dictionary. Well, that's what he did in prison. So again, you don't understand Malcolm unless you understand his family. So Malcolm did his critique and it was over. I raised my hand. And I said, well, this is all fine, but you know, I was then leading the only successful movement in the North to kick the behinds of an entire economic power structure. I was in the beginning of that. We took on the entire economic power structure and defeated them on jobs for blacks and people of color. If you have a job in the state of California, that movement busted it open. And none of us took any of those jobs. Before that, there were no jobs for black people, basically, except uh, some government jobs. Um, the ILWU, my father was a longshoreman, sweeping streets and shining shoes and working in the post office. That was it. And so we're in the midst of the only really successful campaign against economic apartheid. And we did other kinds of organizing. We had a bad team brother named Norman Brown, who woke me up. He's still around. Norman is uh, about two years older than me. Will Ussery, who had been chair of Corps before me, who was a draftsman and um, real smart. Guy named Kermit Scott, who organized Ron Dellum's campaign for Congress. And you're looking at the person that radicalized Ron Dellum, because he was a social worker in the Hunters Point. And when I took over the War and Poverty Program, I created a group and he came into it. He said he wanted to keep us honest. He ended up becoming assistant director of the War and Poverty Program later. My rule is I take no money in any campaign I lead. So we have a powerful movement. At its peak, 10,000 people. 
We gave birth to the free speech movement at San Francisco State, and we gave birth to the Experimental College, which was the forerunner of Black Studies at San Francisco State, before there was Black Studies. So this was one bad movement, and you know nothing about it. So when I raised my hand, you know, I said, uh, hey, Brother Malcolm, why are you always bad mouthing the movement? We're busting open jobs, pinstripe wearing, bow tie wearing, Muslims are going in and getting jobs and we don't have a problem with it. We ain't taking any, it's for the people, that's fine. But then you're lashing out at the movement at every point. Now he had some good points, integration, that's something to lash out against. But nonviolence, give me a break. In the South, it worked. It busted segregation and it got us the right to vote. And I don't see him busting no nonviolence in Ghana, which got them independence, or nonviolence in South Africa under ANC before they went to armed struggle. He didn't knock that, you know, and calling King a traitor and stuff. So, you know, I basically raised the question. All we see is criticism of the movement, yet the movement's benefiting Black folks and people of color and Muslims. And so when is this going to stop? Malcolm's answer was, this was his standard answer, and it didn't work. His answer was, before the Nation of Islam, um, you would have had trouble dealing with the power structure. But now the power structure is afraid of the Nation of Islam. So now they can deal with you. And I said, uh-uh. What power structure is afraid of the Nation of Islam? I said, some white people are. You know, the fruit might have scared a few people. Um, the hate that hate produced that Mike Wallace put on that Malcolm encouraged um, with Lewis Lomax treated the Muslims like they were haters, which was not true, uh, but it might have scared some white people at the grassroots level. But I said, the white power structure ain't afraid of the nation of Islam. You know what I mean? We're the ones kicking the white power structures behind. The nation ain't fighting no power structure. And so then Malcolm said, the messenger would be announcing a political action program soon. We didn't know what that meant because this was in the summer of 1963 and he would be silenced um, in, the, in the winter for the, the statement chickens come home to roost, but actually he was being silenced because there were a lot of forces in the nation that were threatened by him. Malcolm was revolutionary. Um, there was a lot of corruption going on at the national level and they felt threatened. They also thought that Malcolm might succeed the messenger. There's a whole lot of things that went into this and some jealousy was coming from the messenger himself and the FBI was manipulating this. If you watch the show we did on the assassination, you see how that worked. But the, the FBI could only work to the extent that they played on the weaknesses inside the nation of Islam. So once he was ejected, uh, we found out, well, there was a two-line struggle going on in the nation. Malcolm was pushing for engagement. And part of that engagement was the right to vote. Part of that engagement was getting uh, Blacks elected to office who were progressive. And Malcolm was aligned with Adam Clayton Powell. And uh, Powell is the best person to serve in Congress, period. Say what you want to about his playing around. He got more legislation through for poor people than any single person that served in Congress. And there's a series on now um, on TV that James Smalls is advising on dealing with Malcolm and um, Adam Clayton Powell. And it's a fictional history, but it's true. And James Smalls is giving some very good advice uh, on this film. So, um, once Malcolm is out of the nation of Islam, you, you see tremendous growth because while the nation had been good for him up to a certain point, it had become a straitjacket. So you see in a little over a year with his travels to Africa, um, with his interaction with the Black Freedom Movement and with his constant reading, you see the growth in Malcolm. Now I argue this, Malcolm was a revolutionary in the nation. He was a revolutionary out. But out, he had grown to much higher levels. His revolutionary thought had deepened. And so um, this, this was key. 
left out of the autobiography is very little mention of Malcolm's work in Africa. That work was very important. Now, Malcolm himself was circumspect. He didn't talk a lot about what happened in his meeting with Julius Nereri. Um, he only referred to uh, an agreement between him and Kwame Nkrumah uh, that Pan-Africanism was a working framework for Africans in the US and around the world, but no other um, reference to what actually happened in those meetings and no discussion of his meetings with Jomo Kenyatta uh, or uh, Seiko Torre, president of Guinea. And I can understand why, because the government was looking at everything he was doing and uh, he wanted to keep some of it quiet, but I'm sure those meetings were monitored and I'm sure they had a pretty good idea of what was being discussed. But Malcolm, that, uh, that work on the African continent contributed to Malcolm's growth and it contributed to the growth of the Africans who met him on the African continent. In the 70s, Pan-African People's Organization that I'm a member of and found, the founder and chair of, um, we, we did African Liberation Day um, for a number of years, rallying an average of 20 to 25,000 Black people in Oakland, mainly, around African liberation support work. And in 77, when I met Julius Nereri in front of his home, I brought to him a film of an African Liberation Day demonstration uh, that we had. And we were there negotiating on some programs that we wanted to set up uh, in Tanzania. Uh, so um, Malcolm uh, had engaged African leadership and learned some lessons. And one of the lessons he learned um, transformed really his long-term direction. Because when Malcolm was forced out of the nation, when he uh, initially announced his program for Muslim Mosque Incorporated, and then later the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which he patterned after the Organization of African Unity, he basically, with Muslim Mosque Incorporated, formulated it as a Muslim organization, but would be open to non-Muslims. That's kind of contradictory because he's in a transition period where he hasn't really thought through how he wanted to move. And I'm sure the messenger viewed that as some kind of threat that he's organizing another Muslim organization. Of course, he was moving in the direction of Orthodox Islam. But after his trip to Africa, he made two, but his longest trip uh, in 64, um, he begins to see the need to pattern um, his organization after the Organization of African Unity. And that becomes the OAAU, Organization of Afro-American Unity. And he brings in serious black scholars, John Henry Clark, Doc Ben, and a number of others. And they're the ones that shaped the program for the Organization of Afro-American Unity. John Henry Clark was a good friend of mine. I apprenticed under him. When he read my book on Malcolm, he gave me access to his files on Malcolm. And he had tremendous files. Now, John was a principal advisor to Malcolm on African policy and on foreign policy in general. And John's observation of Malcolm was he was one of the quickest studies he ever saw. And he characterized him as the most brilliant mind we produced in the 20th century. I'd qualify that. I'd say the most brilliant political mind. Certainly wasn't the most brilliant scientific mind <laughs> or psych psychological mind, though you could say yes, because he had some in-depth insight into black thought that some of our psychologists need and some have. Some of the Afrocentric uh, psychologists do. So uh, Malcolm had learned some lessons from how things were moving on the African continent and tried to translate that into the US setting. And part of that was his reach out to the Black Freedom Movement. Malcolm's closest relation to the Black Freedom Movement was with CORE. And that's because we were organizing where you had Muslim mosques. Sonia Sanchez, one of the great poets of the Black Arts Movement stated that she first met Malcolm 
um, at a demonstration uh, that CORE held. It was a demonstration on a construction site for jobs for Blacks. And after hearing him make some comments, she went up to him and said that she agreed with some things he said, but disagreed with others. And Malcolm said, sister, I think sooner or later your views will change, which they did. She ended up joining the nation of Islam, ended up marrying a Muslim. And by the way, ended up naming her two twin sons. She came to a meeting of Pan-African People's Organization around 67, ready to pop. She was so pregnant that she could have had her baby right in the meeting, coming to me saying, Shaka, I need names for my babies. <laughs> I said, what are they, boys or girls? Boys. So I named one Mangu, uh, which means God. You can't get a better name than that. And Morani, warrior. And I got to meet both of them at a National Council of Black Studies meeting where she, I, and uh, Danny Glover spoke um, a year ago. So the Nation of Islam and Congress of Racial Equality, we're in the same places interacting. I would go to Nation of Islam meetings um, on Fillmore Street, right around the corner from where the Congress of Racial Equality meetings were. So there was that interaction. So when Malcolm is out of the nation, he's now trying to reach out. And uh, one meeting was held um, at Sidney Portia's home. And in that meeting, um, Malcolm uh, was meeting with King's lawyer. He was meeting with the head of the Urban League. He was meeting with uh, Sister Height of the Council of Negro, National Council of Negro Women. Um, he was meeting with SNCC representative, core representative. So what he was trying to do was work out his idea of what he was then talking about a Black United Front. Uh, so these were efforts on his part to do what he couldn't do when he was in the nation. And his main strategy of raising the civil rights movement to a human rights movement was his move to internationalize the movement and take the US before the World Court, the United Nations. And uh, he presented a a paper to the Organization of African Unity, uh, where he uh, succinctly presented the case for Africans in the US calling on African states to stand up in support of Blacks in this country. So this, this was some of the evolution and growth in, 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 in Malcolm's organizing. Um, Malcolm's house was firebombed. And um, his family was nearly burned alive. The nation blamed him for it. But shortly before the death of the head of uh, the fruit in New York, they admitted. He said, yeah, we did it. Malcolm was lucky to get out of that house alive. And so his most important, I think, message during this period was delivered the day after his house was firebombed. And it's been given different names, but a two record um, composition of this speech is called The Last Message. And I think that's an appropriate title for that speech. And in that speech, Malcolm was heavily sedated because uh, he was, in, was under stress. He hadn't had any sleep and he needed to sleep for a few hours. And so he knew that the drugs made it impossible for him to give a, a coherent kind of speech that he would normally give. So he titled this a talk, not a speech. Um, but it, it's one of the best in content, in form, message to the grassroots, um, ballots or bullets. Those are the two classic speeches of Malcolm. Uh, but the last message has some of the deepest insights because this is uh, Malcolm uh, just before he's forced out, before he's assassinated. And so what does he say? I think the most insightful things he said was that before he had thought 
that it was the struggle on the outside of the American and Western house that was most threatening to uh, the West and to the United States. And he was talking about the African independence movement. And he was talking about the movements for liberation in Asia. And of course, the Cuban revolution. And Malcolm had met with Fidel Castro uh, when he came to New York and Harlem. And uh, again, to the consternation of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, but he made this observation. And this was a part of his reappraisal of um, the, the movements for change led by Blacks in the US and in the Western Hemisphere. And he said, whereas he had formerly thought that what he called the revolution on the outside, which really wasn't a revolution, but it was a movement for independence, was the most threatening. But he said he had come to realize that it is the struggle of Blacks on the inside of the House of the West that was most threatening. He said, because we're in the position to rearrange the furniture. And what did he mean by that? He said that what had happened with colonialism uh, carried out by the British and the French, especially and other European powers in the Caribbean and in South America, the Africans colonized under uh, European rule um, moved into countries like Britain and France and the Dutch countries um, as former colonial subjects. And so they ended up being a force inside these countries and posed a certain kind of prob problem and threat there. But he was really referring most importantly to the position of Africans in the United States. And he was saying that we occupied a strategic position in our location inside the United States because we had the capacity to rearrange the furniture. He also said that our strategic location inside the United States uh, enabled us to create, as we created movements, create chain reactions around the world. That was a original observation on his part, because you can see with Black Lives Matter, as that movement kicks off, it's global. The Black Freedom Movement, the Black Panther Movement, the Black Power Movement. Anytime Blacks move in this country, then we generate movements around the world. Without any money, the US has to intervene. They have to bring their military in. They have to use a vast propaganda network to try and get any kind of impact on how the world sees the United States. But the uh, African American just has to rise up and the rest of the world will respond. Uh, so Malcolm was seeing that and he was beginning to reformulate his views on Garveyism and on Pan-Africanism. Being uh, outside the nation, he could place a major stress on Pan-Africanism. In the nation, his main talk, when he talked globally about global politics, was around the Bandung Conference. That was more what he talked about in the nation. And that was a meeting held by Sukarno in the mid 50s, who was president of Indonesia, a good man, who was overthrown by the American government, CIA, and they murdered a million Indonesians, kept him alive, and he was replaced by a puppet of the United States named Suharto. Uh, so Malcolm held up this Bandung conference because it was an example of African, Asian, people of color unity. And there was only one person from the United States that attended that meeting, Adam Clayton Powell. <laughs> so, uh, but out of the nation, Pan-Africanism came off his lips all the time. And that was really the basis for how he viewed formulating global strategies. So, but by the end of his life, Malcolm had concluded a different kind of Pan-Africanism than the Garveyism that he had embraced in the nation. There was talk that Malcolm had when he first left the nation of possibly returning to Africa, an exodus. And I was a Garveyite at one point. I'm a neo-Garveyite now. 
and I understand where he's coming from. His parents were Garveyites. So the largest black mass-based movement built in the United States of the Western Hemisphere in the 20th century. So I understand that thrust. I come out of it. But Malcolm, after traveling to Africa, I had a similar experience, I think, reached some conclusions. And one of the conclusions was that we occupied this strategic position in the United States. And part of that enabled us to pressure for change on, on uh, American policy on Africa, just as he was calling on Africa to produce some uh, support for blacks in the United States. So Malcolm began to talk about a philosophical, a cultural, a spiritual uh, return home and drawing from political lessons from Africa, historical lessons uh, while we remain here and fight. The main thing when he talked about um, re-envisioning uh, the importance of the black movement in this country, he reached a conclusion similar to the conclusion that King reached and some of the radical members of the Young Turks and the black freedom movement reached. It's certainly one that I reached. Um, and that was that as he looked at Africa and saw where the promise was, and I think Nereri was one of the best that he looked at. Um, in 1973, Pan-African People's Organization sent 10 people to Tanzania. We worked in Ujamaa villages for three months. I lost 15 pounds in the Ujamaa villages. I need to lose it. We were um, doing hard agricultural work. And we brought a dance team along as well. And after they would do African dances, the people wanted to see uh, the funky Broadway. You know what I mean? They want to see the boogaloo. You know, I want to, you know, uh, they want to see the robot. <laughs> they wanted okay. to see. Hold on just a minute. Did you do that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, we brought an African dance troupe to do that. But there is a picture of me dancing at my 80th birthday party. Go check it out. It's I think YouTube. I was there. I think I was there. Yeah, yeah, you were there. <laughs> no, that wasn't me. But we brought some dancers, you know what I mean? So um, Malcolm. Excuse me, excuse me uh, uh, Dr. Tashaka. At about um, 2.40, we'd like to pause and take some questions. I don't know uh, what uh, how, how uh, Professor Smalls was holed up. But uh, at 2.40, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we'd like to take some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, Indada, Teresa is going to be coordinating that. So uh, you might want to put your questions in the chat and then she'll read them or something like that. All, all right. Uh, and, and hey, you are really putting some, some insights into Malcolm that most, you, you, know, you know, we're not getting the Reader's Digest version of Malcolm today everyone. We're getting a, a deep insight from someone, and uh, hopefully I don't insult him by saying this, but when I was in his class, um, you know, he talked about Malcolm and the way he talked about it, I thought his face was going to transform into Malcolm. You know, he was, he, 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 he exudes the, uh, the spirit of Malcolm, but he actually goes in deeper to look at the pluses and minuses, and that's what he's giving us today. And um, you can go on his, you can search for him on YouTube. Just type in Dr. Oba Tashaka. And I think he has over like a million subscribers uh, going in. And uh, I think one of his shows, he had like 63,000 people uh, to go in. So uh, check him out. Also, um, and I don't know what happened to Professor Smalls today, but uh, search for Professor Smalls as well. Deep, deep insight into African uh, knowledge and spirituality, deep, deep insight into Malcolm. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Tashaka. Uh, uh, so, so why don't you go on, and and, and we're going to we're going to be uh, we're, we're going to be taking questions in about ten minutes. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So one of the big transformations that Malcolm underwent, King underwent, a number of us in the movement, not the majority, but some of us. Uh, was a, a radicalization. And Malcolm had been by nature radical. 
even when he was on the streets hustling, he was in rebellion against the system. One of my students characterized it. She happened to be an Islamic person. She called it the stage of confused rebellion. So even when he was on the streets, he was trying to do some stuff where he was exercising his mind, but kind of in a twisted way. But it was still rebellion. But once he got himself grounded in his history and his culture, and the key thing to Malcolm is he underwent transformation in prison. And um, I, a guy named Bulun Leila Wabogo and I, we systematized this because I underwent this same awakening Malcolm underwent, and I wasn't copying Malcolm. I didn't know he had undergone it and didn't know that he had until the autobiography came out after his assassination. But Bulun Leila Wabogo, who's a gifted musician, uh, who was also a chemist and a martial artist and a historian. Um, he and I trace the stages that Black people go on through when they're waking up. This applies to people of color as well. I call it the six-fold stages to mental freedom. And if you go to the Dr. Overton Shocker show, you'll see some of that there. And I've done some other stuff on YouTube on this. That transformation took Malcolm from uh, the level of assimilation um, and a white identity where he said in prison, he didn't even want to associate with black prisoners. I didn't have that problem, but my mind was on remote control and I didn't know it, you know? Uh, so he de-assimilated. A part of his study was a study of transformation. Uh, Manning Marble's book creates the false premise that uh, Malcolm reinvented himself. That's part of the title of his book, Pure Bull. Malcolm transformed himself. He didn't reinvent himself. He took a few things where Malcolm exaggerated his criminal background and then tried to confuse the picture. But Malcolm underwent deep transformation and that transformation was from assimilation to black and African identity and that Malcolm described that transformation process this way, because he had not identified the stages that you go through. Even though he went through them, he was too close to do it. When I was undergoing the awakening, I didn't know what the stages were. I was going through it. Later, you could stand back and then with Bull and Layla and us interacting, we were able to systematize it. And then I've added a few things to it. Uh, so uh, Malcolm described his transformation this way. He said, first, your attitude, no, he said, first, your philosophy changes. Now, this is really showing you the depth of his study because Malcolm was digesting what he read. That's a process that I use, call it internalization. Um, and then he said, when your philosophy changes, your attitude changes. And what he meant by attitude was from negative to positive, um, from imitating your oppressor to trying to become original and creative. And then he said, your thought pattern changes. And it's interesting that he would put attitude first because he had to take a lot of that shifty eye attitude. If you see pictures of Malcolm was on the street, you wouldn't trust, trust him around your dog. He just looked shifty. You know what I mean? You know, when I see that look, you don't get in my house. I tell my wife, there's certain people ain't coming in here. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's not just that they'll foul up the atmosphere. It ain't no, no telling what they're likely to do. Get to case your house and everything. Uh -uh. That ain't happening. You know what I mean? So Malcolm had that shifty look. You know what I mean? But when his attitude changed, that look changed because his thought pattern began to change. And then when his thought pattern began to change, as he said, his communication, he's very precise on this, his communication pattern began to change. What does Minister Farrakhan say about that? He said he never heard Malcolm say a negative thing about Black women. Never. Never. You know? And um, when he marries Betty, ain't no playing around. You know what I mean? That's Malcolm. There's a lot of reasons for that I won't go into. But one of them was, you know, his thought pattern, his communication pattern had changed. And then he said, your behavior pattern changes. Now, the key point about this awakening process is the nation helped trigger this in that uh, it was exposure to 
through his family to the teachings and the organizing work of the Nation of Islam that was the first triggering thing when Malcolm sees that whites are devils. But Malcolm says he's checking um, what the nation, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is saying, he's checking it out, <laughs> which means he's thinking for himself. But the key point is Malcolm's transformation, while it was initially triggered by exposure to the nation of Islam through his family, uh, Malcolm's transformation was deeper than the nation's. The nation did not transform members um, around history, around culture, around politics. And while it did around religion, not necessarily spirituality uh, or culture in the African-American sense, which Malcolm only did unconsciously. Uh, so um, that put him on a collision course with the nation. He didn't know it because that transformation uh, meant that he was totally committed to what he did. Now that was a good thing for the nation because they got a hard worker. They got a person who was one of the two best organizers in the 60s up to the end of the 20th century, him and Ella Baker, two best organizers we produced. And through the nation produced the best discipline organization, which reflected also Malcolm's discipline as well as the discipline of the nation of Islam. Uh, so uh, that was key to Malcolm's growth. In other words, he moves to the point where he wants to restructure society. King reaches that point. A number of the rest of us, I'm a, I'm a revolutionary African-centered scholar. Theophil Obinga stayed at my house for four months after we hired him. You know, I was at John Henry Clark's house and uh, Leonard Jeffries told me that Obinga was looking for a job. Obinga is the best scholar on ancient Kemet in the world today. A university has been named after him, the Dr. Theophil Obinga University, Congo Brazzaville, just recently. The brother's bad, speaks 10 languages, written 17 books, and has got a thousand page book on the pharaohs that he's still playing with. And he ain't never finished. When he was here at my house, I was writing in my study where I'm talking right now at this desk, and he was right behind me at the other desk using a typewriter. You know what I mean? Uh, so, um, Obenga, after he leaves my house, take him to state so he can get some housing. He can stay here in my house as long as he wanted. I was soaking up a whole lot of stuff. I enjoyed Obenga. And he says, Shaka. I said, what? He said, you, because Obenga is an observer, you know what I mean? And he's a real deep thinker. He said, you, a revolutionary among the African centered scholars, you're the only one. The only one. And I'm saying to a bigger, yeah, well, that's a damn shame. You know what I mean? <laughs> so the point is, Malcolm was a revolutionary. Malcolm, by the end of his life, was saying what King was saying. King said this system had to be restructured. King was against capitalism and, of course, against racism. Malcolm said he put it in parables. And by the way, his first master was Paul Robeson, not Elijah Muhammad. Paul Robeson was the first person he apprenticed under. And if you look at uh, Malcolm's thought pattern, his speech pattern, Paul Robeson. Animal analogies, Paul Robeson. His political agenda, opposing the war in Vietnam, Paul Robeson was among the first to oppose the Korean War. His agenda, human rights agenda, comes straight out of Paul Robeson's bag of a anti-genocide agenda, taking that before the United Nations as Malcolm wanted to take the human rights agenda. And Malcolm would always often slip and say, we're gonna charge America with genocide. And then he would say human rights violations. That was Paul Robeson. And then the incorruptible character of both of them. Dizzy Gillespie said his two favorite heroes was Malcolm X and Paul Robeson because they had incorruptible character. You know what I mean? So Malcolm um, got schooled in politics by Robeson and got to see him only once. Uh, he was with uh, uh, Ruby Day's husband and uh, got to see him, but didn't get a chance to talk to him. So uh, by the end of his life, Malcolm used the animal analogies he learned from Paul Robeson to say this, just as a chicken is not designed to produce a duck egg, America is not designed to produce freedom. 
if America, uh, it, 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 if a chicken could produce a duck egg, it would be a revolutionary chicken. If America could produce freedom, it would be a revolutionary system. So Malcolm was thinking about restructuring. And, and by the way, I, I'll end on this one. King and Malcolm reached a juncture of agreement. We've always had these two lines in the black freedom movement. One has been integration, the other has been black nationalism. They merged them, they merged them. And King, by the way, was an African-American nationalist, contrary to what people might think. He was just not ideological. He came out of a black community. He came out of a black church. He came out of a black culture. He had some deep black principles and he stood on them nobly as Malcolm did, proved to be basically incorruptible. Yeah, he had him some women, just like Muhammad Ali did. At best, I think you get slapped on your spiritual hand in heaven for that. And if you're an African, you don't get slapped because you got a thing called polygamy. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, um, um, uh, open it up now. Oba Tashaka, Dr. Oba Tashaka, you know, when I refer to him, I, I refer to him as Saba. That is a word that means teacher, ancient comedic teacher. And the, and the glyph for that is a star. So he is a star, and the other part is it's a doorway, and the other part is a teacher. I would like now, if, if you could, to submit your questions in the chat, and we will take them one by one and, uh, uh, and give uh, uh, Dr. Tashaka a chance to address the, the questions, because I know that he said a lot in this hour. And again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. I don't know exactly what happened. Some people couldn't get on, but at the time where some people couldn't get on, 40 people were on and now we have 51. I was hoping for over a hundred, but that's the way things go. All right, so um, somebody has written some things. Let's see what's in there. All right, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, Dr. Tishaka, could you please explain more about the African promise which, uh, Mal which was Malcolm's conclusion? Can you please explain more about the African promise which was Malcolm's conclusion? I don't know what they mean by African promise. Could they clarify that? Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, you know, take yourself off mute, uh, Minister Amadi, and, and ask directly. Oh, okay, you had said that, um, well, you said that Malcolm came to the conclusion that he saw the African promise. Uh, when you were talking, you said he had came to a conclusion, you know, then you, then you articulated, but you didn't actually um, use those words. So perhaps you already answered that question, but you had to make that statement that. Your, your voice yeah. got muted. Your voice got confused when you made- Oh, oh I'm sorry, you said that- you had said that um, you know that he came to a conclusion. You know the same the same conclusion that you had came to. You know about the African promise, and then you so you went on and explained about it, but you didn't actually use those words. So maybe in your talking about you know his you know transformation, maybe that's what you were talking to about. Yeah. Okay. I the basic same conclusion was that uh, Malcolm. In my case, I came to see when I went to Africa, I stopped romanticizing Africa because I began to see the reality of Africa. And part of the reality was we're a nation within a nation here, just as there are nations in Africa. And so um, while we're African people, we're in different geographical locales and we have also had some different experiences historically, they colonialism, us enslavement. And, that also I began to see that the main role that we could play in advancing African interests was to put pressure on this government to improve the conditions of Africa and particularly around American foreign policy. Now, I know that Malcolm reached a similar conclusion that uh, that was a role that we could play here. That whereas before 
his view was that there could be a massive return of Africans to Africa, he stopped stressing that. He stressed more the role we could play to put pressure on American foreign policy for Africa, but to get Africa to take stands on our behalf. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, so uh, the next question is, if, if Malcolm were alive today, <laughs> what would he do? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a prophet. Okay. But what I would say is this. Malcolm is assassinated um, February 21st, 1965. Three years later, things happen to the Black community that turns things upside down. So the realities that Malcolm was preparing us for uh, in 65, that would shift a lot post-1968. Because what happens post-1968 is Black communities in the United States and African communities around the world a little later are hit by powerful external forces. Deindustrialization, jobs are taken out of the country. Blacks lose a lot of jobs and it fractures black families. We go from 75% two-parent households to today 29%. We have maintained two-parent households for 100 years, 75%. You know? So um, these, are, these are forces Malcolm couldn't predict. And then drugs hit us in a massive way through the counterintelligence efforts of the intelligence agency, CIA and FBI. CIA's admitted their role in this. So then that creates uh, the intrusion of a drug culture in the black community and with blacks losing jobs and black communities being broken up through redevelopment and gentrification, then what you see is an illegal economy becomes a source of survival. And so what you have is these forces and other forces cause and this comes from God. I pipe into God's mind every now and then. This one here, you should take very seriously because everyone that's heard this, they read my book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures. They say this is dead on. That's because I wasn't smart enough to come up with this. This came through me from God, through the light. When I had this experience of the light, student had asked me once, why are the culture so strong? Why has it got so many holes in it? I didn't have an answer. And then I had this spirit intervention and it set a choice between two cultures. So since 68, the forces that have hit African-American communities, some of which I've described and there are others, have put our people in the position of choosing between a Euro-American mad culture and an African-American culture. Now you think that happened in slavery. No, it didn't. We recreated culture in slavery. This is the first time where people have been put in this position. This is particularly difficult because we haven't really analyzed it this way. And it's particularly difficult. I was speaking at Laney about three years ago and a student said, well, so I'm faced with a choice between two cultures. How can I make a choice when I don't even know my culture? Because so many of us have been running around talking about we don't have one. They took it in slavery. Culture is your way of life and design for living. All people have a culture. We created the popular culture, a popular choice of this country and the world. Jane Smalls and I talk about this a lot. The whole world sees this culture. Some of us do, and some of us don't. So that puts us in a particularly disabling position. So Malcolm would have been faced with some different circumstances. Here's the biggest difference for him and Kim. These circumstances mean that the charismatic leader of the 60s, that ain't no longer gonna work. This is the end of the age of charisma. You can have charismatic speakers, that's our culture. Minister Farrakhan, very popular with the youth, trained by Malcolm, you know, great speaker. We've got a lot of people who are good speakers, nothing wrong with that. But the charismatic singular leader who is often a male, that's gone, that's outdated. And what you see with Black Lives Matter, that movement, that's an Ella Baker style leadership model, what they call leaderful 
a whole bunch of leaders. So Malcolm would have found himself in a different set of circumstances and would, would have had to adjust to them. And one reason why you need multiple leaders now is multiple problems. And no single leader is going to have the answers to them. You're going to have to draw on a whole bunch of folks to come up with that. And then Malcolm and King also proved singular charismatic leadership gets targeted and killed. And then if your movement's relying on them, poof, like the magic dragon, they're gone. You know what I mean? So you got to spread your leadership out. I've been arguing this for 30 years. I've been arguing this for 30 years. You know what I mean? And most of the people in my age group ain't listening. That's why I'm doing this thing on Facebook and YouTube, Dr. Obel Tashaka Show. Reach the younger people, because they're the ones that see this. They're also the future. Some of our older people do too. Dr. Tashaka, so uh, the next few questions you've kind of touched on. So one of them was, um, what would Minister Malcolm think about the Black Lives Matter movement and what would be his plan of action against police terror? Um, I think he'd like it in that he's like, he liked SNCC and CORE. He had some disagreements on integration, which by the way, King never seriously believed because King came out of all black community. His organization was all black, you know what I mean? He had a few white advisors. Most of his advisors were black. His lawyer was black. The people that write his, wrote his speeches were black. You know what I mean? He came out of black culture. So um, the key question is, could he adjust to this new leadership model? And Malcolm was certainly somebody that learned, but he would have to be impressed by a movement that was global. And one of the things I'd say about the handling of police violence, I think Black Lives Matter handled it better than the Panthers. They ain't got wiped out as a result of their position. You know what I mean? And so there's some smarts. I'm not saying the Panthers didn't have smarts, but you know, we always like this martyr stuff. We like to come on and honor people on their birthday and all this stuff. I don't like to be martyred. I I, I resolved that I ain't dying for no liberation movement. They've tried to kill me more than once. And I can tell you something happened to the people who tried to do it. I am not into being a victim and I'm not into hanging on no cross. And I don't believe that no sacrifice is gonna save nobody. Now, if you have to, King, I don't think could avoid his assassination. Well, okay. So I think Malcolm would have liked it. And I think the way they're handled is the best they can. The problem with the police issue is a dead end issue. You can only get so much through police reform. Uh, so, some in Black Lives Matter are now moving into economics. Sister Dr. Melina Abdullah, who's one of their best organizers coming out of LA, she is putting money into cooperative economics. That's a good move. And other kinds of economics, which I think Malcolm would also approve of since he was a good economic developer. By the way, that was a gift of him and his family. Um, can you talk about, um, oh, so, so the next question is, Thank you for that uh, answer. Did Malcolm and King have solid plans to work together on the struggle? Um, King and Malcolm only met once formally, and uh, that was briefly at the House of Representatives, the picture you see of Malcolm grinning. Malcolm had a good reason to grin because all the things he had said about King. <laughs> and now he wanted to warm up to him. So that was kind of a funny picture there. But if you read, one of the good things about Manny Marble's book is there are not too many good things, but this is one. <laughs> he showed that there was a great respect that Malcolm had for King. Some of that was shown by his posture on the Montgomery bus boycott. He never said nothing negative about the Montgomery bus boycott. Only a fool could. 97% of black people standing up and busting the back of segregation. I mean, that's what inspired me. And I was a brainwashed Negro at that point, but I could see black people had done something. And by the way, I've never lost a battle. So that was a good example. So, you know, I think that uh, Malcolm, um, he respected King. There was conversation between Malcolm and King through their attorney. And King's attorney would join the Organization of Afro-American Unity later. Uh, and so one of the things that King supported Malcolm on 
was his stand on human rights. In fact, I would say King was clearer on the human rights agenda than Malcolm. Malcolm saw the human rights agenda as international, taking the United States before the World Court, the United Nations, and international bodies and charging them with human rights violations. That's interesting. I've never taken that too seriously because those are bodies the US controls. And the US has not signed on to the uh, Human Rights Commission, you know what I mean? Uh, because they don't want to be charged with genocide, you know? So that, that was nice posturing, but I, I, I didn't think that was a great strategy, in my opinion. It was principled, it was right, but it couldn't accomplish very much. I'm a strategist. And if you don't have an outcome that you can clearly see coming out of a strategy, I wouldn't do it. But King, he understood this. And this was the thing that Maynou Ampen stressed in our interview and discussion on the revolutionary Martin Luther King. And it was this, there's a dividing line with King. There is pre-1965, 55 to 64, and then there's 64, 65 through 68. 65 through 68 is King's revolutionary period. Malcolm was also a revolutionary. And in this period, King met with his staff right after the enactment of the Voting Rights Bill coming out of Selma. I marched in Selma. I was a march marshal and was arrested in Selma. Um, so King told his staff, we passed the civil rights phase. We're now in the phase of human rights. He said the civil rights phase was a cheap phase. The government could pass voting rights legislation, which you see that now they're trying to tear apart. Uh, they could pass desegregation legislation. It costs no money. And he said, these were rights guaranteed under the Constitution. But we've now entered a new stage. It's a stage of human rights. It's beyond the Constitution. And what is that? Immediately, that's putting a roof over people's heads. That's providing jobs for people. That's providing health care. That's not guaranteed in the Constitution. They just have a bunch of abstract rights and no powers. And then he said, in his staff meeting, he said, capitalism's no good. The economy needs to be restructured. Too, many, too few are rich and too many are poor. And so that's a conclusion that Malcolm had also reached. So they had converged. They had much more in common than separated them. <clears throat> and what, how they would have worked together and everything else, who knows? But the point is, they were pretty much on the same page. And the main thing that they were on the page of was integrity. They both had great integrity. And that's something that the nationalists two times, too many times miss on King. King got that Nobel Prize money. That was a whole lot of money for that time. Where'd he put it in the movement? He didn't give a penny of it to his children. His children have become very materialistic. You know what I mean? He didn't even want to own a house. Neither did Malcolm. Because Malcolm said, if you get invested in materialism, you forget about the people. That was King's view. So in many ways, they were on the same page. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you talk more about the efforts of the family to get him, Malcolm, to join the Nation of Islam? Yeah, well, a lot of that is pretty well documented. Uh, <clears throat> the family realized in their fishing expedition, because the nation called recruiting fishing, that it wasn't working on Malcolm. Uh, Wilford, he wasn't listening to the older brothers. And so they had a specific strategy to um, recruit Malcolm. So they sent in Reginald. And Reginald had been with Malcolm on the streets for a while and done a little street stuff himself, not much, uh, and was conscious and proud of being Black and was in the nation. So they saw him as being able to fish Malcolm, that is give him the bait that he'd fall for, which he did. And so it's Reginald that comes in and um, ask him some mysterious questions, which street cats like, you know what I mean? Mysterious things uh, like, uh, who has 360 degrees of knowledge? <laughs> and how much knowledge do white people have? And all this kind of stuff. And so Malcolm would have to say God, 360 degrees, and then white people just had half that knowledge, 
Then Malcolm went around and investigated and found out that some of these whites who had been into these Masonic orders and stuff, they had about that much knowledge. And then of course he told him that white people were the devil. And Malcolm said no, because he had a Jewish friend who was, you know, very good, treated him very good. Well, Reginald was a more strict than Malcolm. Reginald said, yeah, who made most of the money? <laughs> so that killed that, you know what I mean? So uh, then he, he prepares Malcolm for the main message. And that is the hook. And the main message was, in addition to the white people being the devils, was the blacks are gods, blacks are the originators of civilization, that white people had stolen our history from us, brainwashed us. So that was the hook. And that's what begins, Malcolm said, because once he realized that he was calling himself the devil, but the devil was really his oppressor. And by the way, enslaved blacks called whites devils, by the way, you know what I mean? That ain't no racist term. By the way, the Chinese called whites who put opium in China and everything else and said, you know, used a derogatory word saying no dogs and another term for the Chinese allowed in parks, you know, they called them devils. So that was got what got Malcolm to thinking. So that was the first thing he said, he began to think his first thoughts independently in his life. That's the same experience I had in a different way. Then his family brings in reading material. The autobiography leads you to believe that Malcolm's reading material was the prison library. Yeah, he read the prison library, but those were all white books given by a rich white man because one of his family members had been in prison. But the black books all came from Malcolm's family. They were brought in from black bookstores and that's where he got J.A. Rogers and a host of other writings, basic fundamental writings and then more developed writings. So. Uh, that's also how, you know, you know, the family hooked him and then providing him a job when he gets out of prison and uh, his oldest brother uh, encouraging the messenger to work with him. The messenger had already seen his talent through their own communication. Can you uh, talk about, um, you know, I, I just want to pause. There's a book. It's uh, East Indian. It's called the Upanishads. What that means is sitting near the teacher and listening. And when I got a chance to go to Egypt with Dr. Ben, he talked about how knowledge was transferred. And he said it wasn't written down that it was the, the teacher speaking into the ear of the student. And that's what we're receiving today. We're getting that type of knowledge. Uh, Bill Johnson had a question. And it refers to the stages of freedom. Uh, he, uh, he, you know, he said six or seven. Did you say six or seven, or did you say three? Because you had philosophy change, attitude change, thought pattern change, communication pattern change. Were there three others after that? Yeah, it was philosophy, attitude, uh, thought, communication, behavior. So that's five. But those are not stages of changes. Those are markers for change. It's, 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 it's indicating what he was going through, but those aren't the stages that you go through when you're waking up. Malcolm was going through them. He was too close to see it, so he couldn't mark them out, you know. Okay. Um, okay. This, this next question was, um, you know, about Black Lives Matter. You kind of addressed that. Someone said, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Tashaka. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, Reverend um, Washington, I'm glad he could join us today from Los Angeles. He asks, uh, did Malcolm have a view regarding reparations? I don't think it was prominent, but he would su certainly support it. Uh, he often talked about how, um, you know, our wealth was robbed and everything else through enslavement. So uh, there wasn't a big reparations movement at the time that Malcolm was around, but his thoughts would certainly support that, uh, would see a need for that. While he also saw a need for us to build economic independence ourselves. So 
you know, he, he would definitely support that. You know. um, and this question comes from Indada Teresa. Do you make a distinction between Black Lives Matter, the movement, and Black Lives Matter, the organization? Yeah, um, Black Lives Matter, the reality is there are many groups that are making up this force against police violence and defund the police and ending prisons and a whole lot of things. A bunch of networks, because given the way black communities have been broken down since the forces that have hit us since 68, no single group is gonna be able to command that kind of respect. So you've got a lot of hookups. And if you look at, for example, the Black Lives Matter platform, that platform has been shaped by a lot of different groups around the country. So there are forces that are dealing with police violence and stuff that are not strictly Black Lives Matter. And in fact, the George Floyd kickoff, Breonna Taylor kickoff, that didn't come from Black Lives Matter. That was a spontaneous uprising coming from the people. But because Black Lives Matter was the best organized, they had bottled air, which is their slogan, Black Lives Matter, and they had a structure. Uh, they were the ones that were the uh, primary spokespersons and their slogan could be picked up by all kinds of networks. So everybody holding a Black Lives Matter banner is not necessarily in Black Lives Matter. They have 30 plus chapters around the country and are getting huge funded. Uh, so um, yeah, there's, there's a difference. There's all kinds of networks that are out there. And that's good because it's very hard for the system to come down on all of them. And, you know, they come up with all kinds of creative ideas that way. So it's good. And then here's another point to really get straight. With Black families being weakened, extended family communities being weakened, real pressure has been put on Black women. Black women are holding up families. And so it's only right that they play a major part in leadership. And it's about time. You know what I mean? Well, this next question is, is kind of lengthy. So uh, bear with me as I read it. It says, uh, Malcolm said, obedience to the law and self-defense is very important. Your thoughts on our people collectively together creating a new covenant amongst our people based on these principles. Since it is quite evident that the covenant we have been living by, biblically speaking, has our people divided based on ideology differences and the interpretations of the covenant we have been living by, uh, look at the results in 2020. How we as a people are so divided. Oh, oh look, at, look at the... Okay, let me back up. So, so that shows how we are people of the body. He says, to me, it is a covenant based on belief, which is not work for the whole race. Your thoughts on creating a new covenant for our people to live by, which will be written by us based on principles to live by. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Gordon, if I messed up your question. Uh, uh, okay, first of all, self-defense. Um, Malcolm was an advocate of self-defense, and that can, included armed self-defense. I did a couple of shows on uh, Dr. Obertushaka's show with uh, a brother named Dr. Akinyele Moja, and he's written a book on We'll Shoot Back. Have you read that? Imhotep, have you read I that? I have not. I have not. Uh, maybe Gordon. Gordon, uh, can you answer that question if you're still on? Have you read that book that uh, uh, Brother Tishaka just mentioned? Okay, this is Gordon. No, I haven't read it. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah so that was, that was a, what was the a question? Operation. I'm kind of a new a new person to this uh, through my cousin, uh, cousin George, but I've, I've studied Black history and I love I just love listening to Malcolm X and all the great ancestors, John Henry Clark, uh, it just goes on and on. I'm real honored to be here. So the question I had was, it seems like I, already I haven't read the book you told me. You, I got it. So I'm, I'm going to get to the question. I was just asking you, had you read this book? 
because no, I haven't. I yeah, haven't. so I, so that's part of it addresses this. Um, the the issue of self defense, Akinyeli Omoja, Dr. Akinyeli Omoja, this is his PhD dissertation, but it's a study of self defense traditions in the Mississippi freedom movement. And uh, it's a very good study. And it's important because Mississippi is probably the most violent state on the planet, definitely the United States. So putting up some armed self-defense there is really important. So what he shows in that, and I'm, I'm answering your question through action here, is that many Northern blacks went to the South to teach black people how to arm self-defense. And they discovered they're already armed and they're already defending themselves. But they were armed and defending themselves in very smart ways. You know, um, there was a brother that Ella Baker sent Bob Moses to, and uh, Bob Moses was her best apprentice, best student, best organizer in SNCC. He's running the algebra project in Mississippi with Dave Dennis, who was a former field secretary for CORE. He's too humble to say he was the best organizer. He was. So he was sent uh, to a brother uh, in Mississippi uh, to give them direction to figure out uh, where the movement should go. His name was Amzie Moore. Amzie Moore had been a leader of the um, uh, black movement in Mississippi in the 50s. They rallied as many as 25,000 black people in Mississippi in the 50s. And Amzie Moore was armed. If you come into his house, he gave you a gun. Wherever he went, he was armed. He never took the same way going to a place two times. You know what I mean? So he understood. He was ex-military, but he's, he's living in Mississippi. And then there were other, there was a group called the Regional Council of Negro Leadership that operated in Mississippi in the 50s. So the first thing is Black people understand self-defense. They understand self-defense. The grassroots is smarter than most of the political people because the political people are out here making policy statements and stuff. You don't advertise self-defense. You just defend yourself. You don't make no advertisement on it. You know. So that's the first thing I would say that uh, Blacks have worked out a whole lot of different ways to um, use armed self-defense under circumstances in which this country has made black use of weapons illegal, uh, done everything to see that we not be able to exercise this. So King himself um, believed in the right of the people to defend themselves. He himself was an advocate of nonviolence as a way of life. And he was an advocate of nonviolence on demonstrations. But he knew the average black person was not gonna be nonviolent in their home, uh, in their community in general. And King was armed up to the time of, you know, during the Montgomery bus boycott when his views shifted. Bayard Rustin began to persuade him to consider nonviolence. So that was his principal position, but he recognized the value for self defense. You made a side comment there. I don't know if you intended this, but, you know, you're saying that we're dis disunited and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, who is it on a general level? <laughs> okay. But if you look okay. at if you look at black people, uh, yeah. when it has come to unity, we have shown more a greater amount of unity than any other people in this country. The Montgomery bus boycott, ninety seven percent of black people supported that boycott. So when we're in action that we agree to, there's great unity. Mm -hmm. uh, the Garvey movement, the Garvey movement uh, didn't get its unity from Jamaica in the beginning, or the Caribbean. It got them from Blacks in the United States and no. Southern Blacks. They were the ones that were the base of the Garvey movement. Uh, Louisiana had over 65 chapters of the UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, as, as members of the Garvey organization, chapters in violent Louisiana, you know what I mean? And Mississippi had chapters of the Garvey movement. So. Um, you know, this picture that we're just disunited, okay? Black Lives Matter. Is that an example of us being disunited? I don't think so. 50 cities exploding, 50 countries 
And by the way, Blacks led the way to defeating Trump. Do we know a victory when we see one? Do we? <laughs> Hear me? Yeah. And guess what? We scored the victories against, I don't use this term white supremacy. White supremacy might be high. I got a size 13 shoe and it's gone up the behinds of the biggest corporations on the planet. I kick butt. That's just me. Our people have won victories. The biggest victories in the 20th century was dismantling Southern style apartheid through segregation and the complete denial of the right to vote. We didn't dismantle white power, but we scored victories on those two levels. And that has led the right wing to see themselves as dispossessed. And Donald Trump is the major um, author or thinker of this idea of dispossession. Mm -hmm. Stop the steal. You know what I mean? Steal my butt. We whipped her behind. We outflanked you. Black Lives Matter and COVID-19 put him out of the White House. If he had handled COVID-19 right with his 4 million new white people that came in and more white women the second time than the first that should tell you something about their culture, uh, he'd be back in the White House. But Blacks outflanked him. We led the movement that put Trump out of the White House and now preparing him for the jail house. So I don't think that's just, you know, yeah, our communities are not fully united. Yeah, there's a lot of work we have to do, but there's a lot that we've done. And this movement, what I like most about Black Lives Matter is they've studied our history. They've drawn from the best of our playbook. They've taken the King playbook of the march which we didn't use in the San Francisco freedom movement because ours was economic. The march wouldn't work. But the march has served as a good mobilizing technique against the police. Mm. You don't get much, but you got a movement. Now that's big. That's mm. real big. You hear me? And, yep, then they, hear you. <laughs> and, and then they've used the Ella Baker model of collective leadership. And then they've mm. been smart. They were silent during most of the Trump administration. So people could say, well, they're afraid of Trump. Well, I don't know, but that was smart. Uh, what Trump didn't see wasn't thinking about. He's not exactly a deep thinker. Have you observed? You know what I mean? So they yeah. were up there posturing. So all I'm saying is, um, if you get a movement that's got 50 cities, uh, 50 states in motion, 50 countries in motion, ain't that some unity? And ain't that some kind of victory? You kicked the behind of what was crypto fascism that was going to turn into fascism in a second term. So don't be telling me how defeated we are. That's a mentality that is bull. It's not based on reality. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, I would hate to have to play chess uh, across uh, Dr. Tushaka. Uh, I'm sure that he's the next. And player. remember what I said about chess. War is not chess, it's poker. It's poker. You know why? Because it's unpredictable. That's so right. there are only so many moves in chess. War don't work like that. You true, hear true. me? Best chess players ain't going to do well in war, I don't think. Because, oh. hey, you got to read your opponent's mind. Can you do that? And then understand the unpredictable is going to be probably what's done. A good strategist never does what's predictable. You know what I mean? This is why I sit close to the teacher. Uh, next question is, and this is coming from one, one of our uh, mental health care uh, professionals and workers. How did Malcolm manage his mental, this is probably gonna be our last question, it's 319. How did Malcolm manage his mental, emotional, physical health? Did he have specific practices he, he upheld? How did Malcolm manage his mental, emotional, emotional and physical, physical health? health? And, and yeah. did he have specific practices he upheld? Um, I think that he managed the mental and the emotional largely through transformation. That, that transformation played a big part in his maintaining mental and emotional balance in that sense and spiritual balance, his growth. His reading was, was real key to that. And then his service to his people. Um, Malcolm practiced the uh, Nation Islam diet 
which was a very good diet uh, in that, you know, they, they recommended one meal a day um, and um, a healthy diet. That was one of the best things that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did. When they performed an autopsy on him, they said he should have been dead 20 years early, earlier. Now, when they performed one on King, they said King's body looked like he was 60 years old and he was 39. You know what I mean? So the dietary stuff from the Nation of Islam was pretty good. But Malcolm didn't always do the best with that because he was an ex-drug addict and had, has, had, had used alcohol. So he had a lunch. His lunch was a banana split. <laughs> Because he needed he needed that sugar fit to kind of compensate for what he had lost with alcohol, you know, and drugs. So and, and then, of course, he would drink him a whole bottle full of milk um, at dinner. Uh, so um, his dietary practices were good, but not good enough. And in fact, when Betty first saw him, she was a nurse. She saw that he lacked nutritional uh, fortitude. In fact, Malcolm had passed out and had been put in the hospital in the 50s. And it was largely because of the strain, the, the constant work. He only got about four hours sleep a night. Me, at my age, I only need five. But at his age, he needed seven or eight. Now, what age is that? Uh, 150. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I was born before the pyramids. <laughs> I like my age. I'm 81, going on 82. So Malcolm, um, he had a problem with, with that, even though there were saving features of the Nation of Islam diet. Uh, so uh, he didn't get enough sleep. But what I uh, he, he kept a good body tone. He was never overweight. Um, being away a lot, he was away from family a lot. So that was uh, the nature of his makeup. It wasn't just that he was the principal organizer of Nation Islam. That was Malcolm's personality. He tended to put whatever he was doing before family, even though family was his foundation. So I think that that created a certain amount of problems in terms of his own life, you know, um, and in terms of interacting with his love partner, uh, Betty. Uh, so, you know, because there was some strains in that relationship. Uh, so, you know, okay. that's, that's kind of Malcolm. He didn't have the psychological problem. Remember, Malcolm was somebody who was, along with other ministers, working with um, alcoholics and drug addicts and getting them off of alcohol and drugs. And that's because they had done it themselves. And what I understand with what the nation did, what Malcolm did through the nation, is that you didn't have to go through a daily meeting and stuff once you went through your transformation. That's what I understand about the nation's transformation. Not that the daily meetings aren't good, it's better than drugs, but uh, they didn't have to do that. So, you know, I think that that was another uh, strength of the nation and it was part of Malcolm's fortitude. So, you know, I, I'd say it's up and down. Also, here's, here's a quirk of Malcolm's. He was a great listener in public, but he did not listen in private. And I know why, but I can't explain it here. But I'll simply say that that sometimes led him to make wrong decisions, you know what I mean? And uh, starting with Reginald telling him when he was in prison, the messenger was playing around. Malcolm said he didn't see it until it hit him upside his head. You know what I mean? Come on, everybody in the nation knew it, you know? So um, that means that had he known that, well, we'll see what he would have done. But it was a lot of stuff. It's possible that Malcolm could have survived the assassination if he had listened to people. I've told you, uh, Imhotep, that his best move, I'm a strategist. By the way, Malcolm was not a strategist. He was a gifted speaker a great organizer, a hell of a thinker, a hell of a human being. But strategy was not his gift. I can tell you because some of those moves he made, those were not strategic moves. And one of them is he knew some folks were out to kill him for a year. He knew who was going to do it. Now, hell, the first time I know that, I'm taking measures. 
He was avoiding the places. That's not taking measures. You know what I mean? So um, not listening. His sister was telling him, get out of the country. Uh, there's a brother who wrote a book on uh, Malcolm's uh, mother. Um, and uh, he had, he was in London when Malcolm debated a minister, I think, of the House of Lords. He won the debate, but they didn't give him the debate, but he won it. And he was advising Malcolm to leave the country. Now, of course, you could say the CIA can get you anywhere. True, but not necessarily true. They didn't get Castro. 400 attempts. 400. You hear me? Uh, so he had a better chance hanging out. He didn't know it then. The best place for him would have been Tanzania. He didn't know that because that he'd gone to Ghana when he did, and Kruma got overthrown later. So he'd have to go somewhere else. And Guinea would have been a good place. At least they got a military there. Rat Brown was in that place. You know what I mean? So um, you want to talk about health? Well, uh, this is your life. And uh, some people would say, oh, but he'd be a coward. Lenin ran out of Russia to hide in Germany during the early phase of the Russian Revolution. And when World War II was at its peak, the Germans sent him back to Russia in a boxcar on condition that if he becomes leader of Russia, which he did, he'd pull out of World War I, which he did. He was going to do it anyway. You know? So roaches hide out. Everything in nature hides out. Don't you see a bug when it gets into your house and they're on the rug? What they do is they freeze. They don't know you can see them because that's the hideout strategy of nature. You know, you hide out under a blade of grass. That ain't cowardly. That's strategy. You hear me? So that was a problem with Malcolm. You know, he didn't listen. He's a human being. We all got these quirks. And that was one of his quirks. And that's a hell of a big one. You know what I mean? So, and, and so people can say, yeah, they could have got him anyway. Yeah, Mighty Whitey can get you anywhere. Guess what? Mighty Whitey doesn't get everybody anywhere. Guess what? Sometimes you get them. You hear me? Huh? So all I'm saying is maybe he could have come back later. Maybe not. But that was his chance. So that's, that's just a side thing. I think listening better would have helped him a lot. Listening is real key. You I'm see me listen. right in my mouth, but I'm a good listener. I listen, baby. You hear me? And I don't care where the advice is coming from. If that advice sounds good, I'm following it. And I don't care who you are. I could love you and you give me the wrong advice. I ain't following it. I don't care because I've learned early. You suffer the consequences from bad advice. Everybody else maybe unintentionally gives you the bad advice. They move on. You operate on it. You get hurt. So listening is real key. He was a good listener in public bad one in private. And that private advice is sometimes the most important advice you get because those are people that know you. You know what I mean? Know you. And by the way, my book on Malcolm's the only one that pointed that quirk out. You know what? That's, uh, that leads us into the very last question is, is 329. And it's from Minister Amadi. I'm sorry. I'm sorry from the, all the other comments and questions that, that we didn't get to, but he says, are your books still available? especially your book on Malcolm. So uh, how, can, how can people get your book? Uh, the book on Malcolm is not available. My other books, The Art of Leadership, Volume 1, The Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap Caused by a Choice Between Two Cultures, go to Gumroad, G-U-M-R-O-A-D, over to Shaka. And uh, you can buy the books directly there. We publish them, we get them printed, and um, we, we mail them out. So we'll mail them out to you. And uh, my book, The Mother Principle, is selling for $1,000 on Amazon. <laughs> I'm glad I already have my- $1,000. Now, not there's that, a reason. There's not a reason. That it's not worth it, but I'm glad There's I a reason. Have. Amazon ain't getting my books. A. B, it's a classic. And see, the books that are selling best are not the new ones. They don't have hardly any, because I ain't given any. 
but it's the used ones. And so it's considered a classic. So the used one, I suppose if my signature is on it, it's even worth more money. That book's a classic. And as you've made it a, a point, Imhotep, it's the hardest thing I ever did. It came from the beautiful light of God. And um, I tried to uh, write something that would be a thank you to God. That was written. It was not written the way I normally think. I'm a linear thinker. I'm a child of Obatala, the only Orisha in the Yoruba system that is uh, linear. I'm linear. But this book is not linear because when you pipe into God's mind, it's whole. And so what I tried to do was to return the beauty of the vision of just societies that this book uh, contains by beauty. And so I could have written it in a way that it would have been maybe a little bit more approachable. My language is basic. I, I don't use big words and stuff, but this, was, this is for my people, for humanity, but this was to thank God. This was to thank God for this beauty that God bestowed on me. It was the most beautiful experience of my life. Fanya, who was there, who's my good friend, helped me do this negotiation in my first marriage. She was the one giving me advice at different times. Don't do this, <laughs> do that. <laughs> I'm listening, you know what I mean? Uh, and it was out of a uh, great trial. Uh, a year and a half of, actually four years of trial that this book then emerged, me dealing with the feminine side of myself. And um, so, uh, you know, the mother principal took 15 disciplines to write. I led the campaign that whipped the biggest bank in the world, Bank of America. That was the roughest, toughest organizing I did. Writing this book was a hundred times harder than beating the Bank of America hundred times harder than facing the FBI and CIA, but it was beautiful work. It wasn't terror work. I have no fear. In fact, I like a fight. So I don't like anybody trying to kill me, but I like a fight. You know what I mean? Because I've already figured out how I'm taking you out. So you covered, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm like a cat, baby. I love that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, uh, what, so, what, what day is that? Uh, August? Uh... August the 4th. August the 4th. So. Louis Armstrong's birthday, by the All way. Right. Don't okay. be telling me it's Barack Obama's. That's my birthday. I'm born. No, I'm going to say that, man. And Louis Armstrong, who if there was one innovator in jazz, it was Louis Armstrong. And he wasn't the Tom that he's portrayed to be. He was one hell of a beautiful brother and lived in the heart of the Black community. You hear me? Uh, and took no mess. A beautiful brother. Last yeah. thing here in the chat, uh, Dr. Tashaka says, Asante Sana, for this history lesson and wealth of knowledge, please share this response with Baba Oba Tashaka. So let's uh, let's take ourselves off mute. We don't care if it's uh, if it's if it's, let, let's 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 give him. Thanks.